by uh, Emilia Powell, who is a professor of political science uh, and law at the University of Notre Dame. One of the reasons we do these lectures is because, as academics, we're quite good about promoting our work when it, before it's published and uh, when we talk about it with each other all the time. But then we don't do so much afterward. After we've done all this work and we have you know, an entire uh, set of findings and so forth, then we sort of say, okay, on to the next project. So this is a way of celebrating uh, Professor Powell's uh, book on the peaceful resolution of territorial and maritime disputes. This is really just one of several works that she ha has published on very interesting topics, uh, including Islamic law states and international law and legal traditions and international courts. Uh, I have known Professor Paul for quite a few years. Uh, we've overlapped in a number of different areas on issues, especially relating to international adjudication and dispute settlement. And she is going to uh, present uh, to us uh, the core findings of her book. She'll speak for about half an hour, and then we will open things up for Q&A, so please do not hesitate uh, to ask any questions. Uh, one of the things, um, in addition to a, a more general theory about strategic behavior and dispute settlement, uh, I know she's also going to address the very high-profile uh, dispute involving the South China Sea arbitration between the Philippines and China, an issue that was on the front page of the New York Times this morning and is perennially one of the most vexed dispute settlement issues relating to the law of the sea. So without uh, any further delay, please join me in welcoming Professor Powell. Thank you, thank you very much, Larry, for having me. Um, such a generous introduction. I'm very delighted to be here, and thank you to all for coming, despite your, I'm sure, very busy schedules. And so, yes, I'm going to be speaking about the book that literally just came out. I'm really bi a big fan of the cover. To me, it looks classy, and it signals territory and maritime, because we got blue there. So the book addresses the puzzle, why do states, when they decide to settle a dispute peacefully, um, choose a particular method. It's a big question. It deals with really important disputes because territorial folk and maritime um, constitute really important things that countries argue about. And those disputes um, have exceptionally high stakes because if you lose a territorial or maritime dispute, you're, you're losing an island or you're using a swath of land and whatever is in that island, around that island. Um, so natural resources, um, you're losing maritime zones. So it's a huge stake dispute. Um, the book, I would say, is really unique because I would say it scores low on the boredom scale. <laughs> um, what that means is that if, even though we do the political science legal research, we actually speak with people. So with policymakers and international lawyers, judges, state council involved in those disputes. So even though we have some awesome patterns of those conflicts, we learn about how idiosyncratic they are. And we hear from people involved. So I would say the book is not removed from reality. And then we study many of those disputes um, in particular, the South um, China Sea um, arbitration. No. No. Oh, there. It's good. Okay. So this is a nice graph um, because it really illustrates what the book talks about. So, you know, when states have a dispute over territory or a maritime zone, they can do nothing about it. They can maintain a status quo. They can say, you know... The dispute is bad, but it's not bad enough for us to do something. We will let it go. So this is maintaining status quo. We call it negative peace because it's peaceful, but it's really negative. It's not resulting anyway. They can use force, and of course, we don't want countries to engage in force because we know that especially territorial disputes are incre incredibly dangerous. So they escalate very fast. They cause casualties, mass casualties, actually, and are most likely to escalate into full-blown war, as we see around. 
Um, and then finally, states can say, okay, let's do something about this dispute. And this is what that book is about. It's about peaceful resolution. So states attempt different things. Um, and when states decide to engage in peaceful resolution, they have to say, well, now that we decided that we're going to go the peaceful route, which peaceful route are we taking? And that's our research question. Wrong way. All right. This is pictures, so this is fun. I don't know what I'm touching here. <laughs> This is like acting up. I'm just going to be using this. If Back to fun picture. You can, you can yeah. be fine, but you can this. also use it. Yes, <laughs> do manual. Okay. So states can do negotiations. This is really easy. You know, states that are engaged in one of those territorial or maritime disputes, they, they can decide to um, meet and talk things through. The image here is um, Belgium, Netherlands, Muse River negotiations. This was a really interesting dispute. Those two countries, um, part of the border is along a river, Meuse, and they signed a treaty in mid 19th century that kind of delimited the, the border. But then they, they were dealing with navigation on the river, and in order to improve navigation, like land got swapped inconveniently. And so for a while, they just kept, you know, it is what it is, but finally, in 2016, they negotiated a solution to it. They swapped lands that were on the wrong side of the river. Very successful, and many territorial disputes and maritime are resolved via negotiations. But sometimes uh, negotiating an island or a swath of land is just not possible because states are unwilling to talk about something that they consider fundamentally theirs. They need a third party to help. So we have all of this area of non-binding third party methods. Mediation, conciliation, good offices, and inquiry. An example is a very recently settled dispute between Lebanon and Israel. 27th of October last year, so almost to the day. Lebanon and Israel had a dispute over their maritime border for a long time. And suddenly, there were natural gas reserve, reserve discovered. So in order to drill, the companies need to know who this is what. So the cost of continuing the dispute were so high that they had to settle it. Um, there was a mediator from the United States, Amos Hochstein, that came and mediated and of course you can't see a border maritime border but i took this picture literally two weeks after the border was settled because i was so very excited that it's finally done can't see it but it's done okay and then states that really want a third party involvement with large amount of international law can resort to arbitration or adjudication these are binding methods once a decision is issued States are supposed to abide by those. Okay. Arbitration, we had the Eritrea Yemen arbitration over Hanish Islands, very successful in the late 90s. Um, settled, uh, sovereignty awarded, and everybody is moving on. Adjudication here, we have International Court of Justice, um, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. These are courts, adjudicators. A picture here is from Bahrain, Qatar. They had a really long ongoing territorial slash maritime disputes over islands and zones and shoals and, and this little, little fort. And in 2001, it was successfully settled in the ICJ. So the book is asking, why would you choose this over that over that? Okay? And the theory. Really, we believe that states are strategic. They don't just choose any method because it looks good, because they're hopeful, or for whatever reason. They are strategic. They hire a multitude of lawyers to help them establish probability of what method is going to help them yield an optimal outcome. What do they want? They want to win. At least they don't want to lose. Again, we're talking sovereignty. Swaths of land, fish, oil, all kinds of stuff. So they want to win, they don't want to lose, and they want to do so with least levels of uncertainty. 
So what they want to go through that process knowing, you know, it's looking good, we got those lawyers who are likely to win. This is what the book is about. Uh, we call it the theory of strategic selection. And states strategize when they choose between the pictures, right, between the method. But once they hone in on the method, they continue to strategize. So the lawyers get busy at the ICJ, at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, at the arbitration, and they do things to make sure that states feel good about the enterprise, okay, and that they will win. We call it kind of two stages. So first is choice of venue, strategic selection, like they're choosing venue. <coughs> and then with the venue, they frame their claims, they shape procedures. Um, so it's all about strategy. What factors determine the choice of a method? Like why would you choose negotiation of the over mediation over adjudication? Well, remember, just remember, you want to win and you want to feel good about the process. So states like to come back to methods that have been favorable to them in the past. Makes perfect sense. So states that have won at the ICJ, for instance, they're going to be more likely to come back to the ICJ. On average, that's true. They look at this win-loss record, not only analyzing their own experience, but also regional. So they look around at their friends in the region and say, oh, this friend of mine here, this other country, has won in the ICJ on a similar issue. I may have a shot. Okay, so, so this is what matters. There's this big literature that suggests that whatever goes in inside a country as far as law determines how that country views a court. For instance, are you a high rule of law country? Do you have judicial independence inside? Um, what is your domestic legal tradition? So, so these are some of the factors that determines, um, that determines the state choices. Within venue, so here we got a lot of insights from international lawyers, and I'm going to read you some of some of those citations because they're just fun. This 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 one um, guy that has represented states in front of ICJ told me, a state is not just deciding to allow the train leave the station, like let's go to the ICJ, right? But it's also analyzing what would be the best route for it to get where the states wants it to go, and where there are risks that the train gets diverted or Derailed. So what do states do? They frame the claim. A common misperception in the, in the literature is that, let's say you have a dispute over territory. States will attack a court, so to speak, with the maximum claim size that they can. They're just going to go for it. That's false. States strategize. They're going to pick stronger claims, they're going to do away with weak, uh, weak claims. They will use certain maps to visualize um, their argument. So how a case is presented really matters because the perspective on facts can be influential. And then you have the legal counsel, the guy that makes all kinds of money. And this, this, this one interviewee of mine said that the lead legal counsel is like a conductor of the orchestra. You know, because he's saying, you do the maps, you do this, you know, whatever they have to do. The biggest job is making sure that all of the people in the legal team are strategizing and are, are on the same, on the same uh, team. So I want to show you this picture. This is my favorite picture, and I think everybody really likes it when I present the book. It's called The Predatory Seabird. So, so, so let me give you the background of this. Uh, one of the ways that states strategize is via maps. H how you present facts. Yeah. All right. This map was used by a legal council of Trinidad and Tobago. See? Here. Right? It was a dispute between Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados, a maritime <laughs> dispute over maritime zone, and the guy that represented um, Trinidad and Tobago, James Crawford, he hired a geographer to draw a map. I interviewed the geographer. 
And I'm speaking with Martin Pratt, who drew the, the predatory bird map, and he told me the story. Um, so he presents the map to James Crawford, who represents the, the thing, those two islands, Trinidad and Tobago, and says, you know, I apologize for the colors. They're so dramatic. And James Crawford says, no, these are actually perfect. And listen to what he said in front of arbitration tribunal. Actually, it looks to me like a predatory seabird about to eat the island of Tobago which makes Barbados's recent overtures to Tobago part of the picture, you may say. After all, they may as well finish the job having eaten the surrounding environment. There is nothing left but the egg. Do you see the strategy here? This is the map presented by the Council of Barbados. A lot less dramatic, isn't it? Do you see the bird here? No. I mean, if I went and threw collar at it, it's the same reality but it's strategized differently. Yeah. So this is an example of this within venue strategic selection. All right, so the book does look at all territorial disputes from Second World War till right now. So massive data sets, um, a lot of interactions between states, and, and then we do those insights from policymakers. We do the South... Um, China Sea Arbitration as a case study to kind of bring out the, the patterns. So, so what do we see? Um, we see that, you know, what, what makes states choose different things? Number one, winning does matter. So if you have won in the past, you are more likely to choose a particular venue. Your friends have won in the past in a similar issue, meaning your regional friends. You're going to also follow suit. States are very strategic in, in analyzing each other win-loss record. So if I have a dispute as a state with another state, I'm going to use, a, use my win-loss record and this other state. So I'm not going to go somewhere that my opponent has won repeatedly at. Also, so very strategic thinking here. This relationship between domestic law and international law is super complicated. For instance, we find that democracies are not naturally predisposed to international courts. That, that, that's a very weak, unstable relationship. Um, much of the literature tells us that democracies have this respect for rule of law, so it seems like they will also externalize this respect. Um, and use international courts. We really don't see that in territorial and maritime disputes. It's unclear even if levels of rule of law determine states' choices. Again, shaky relationship. Just because you have high judicial independence, um, high compliance with adverse rulings internally um, on the part of government, does not mean that you're going to automatically love international courts. What does matter is the domestic legal tradition type. We do find that Islamic law states prefer mediation. A very strong findings, we see it in the Middle East, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar, Oman, very often try to mediate disputes instead of going to courts, to arbitrations. This is a very strong regional pattern. Common law states tend to prefer negotiations and civil law countries, um, international courts. Why is it? Those courts are designed um, very similar to courts um, and principles operating in the civil legal tradition. So this is like the, the broad, these are the broad results from the book, which just show us what states really prefer and what doesn't matter. So now I'm gonna briefly talk about the South China Sea dispute and how those things work. So, so number one, I mean, the dispute was super complicated because we have multiple countries involved, but the country that initiated arbitration was the Philippines. The Philippines sought arbitration. Um, it was Annex 7 arbitration via UNCLOS, UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, against China. China did not show up at the proceedings or really acknowledge that anything is going on. There was literally a, a water bottle sitting 
at the arbitration tribunal and nobody was there to drink it, right? Um, now, I want to show you the strategy that was happening um, in, the, in the dispute because the Philippines really did not pursue everything that they could. My co-author and I did a series of interviews about that case when it was happening um, on the ground. So they were in the Philippines when the arbitration award came out. So we got immediate kind of insights from policymakers. So first of all, Philippines strategized jurisdiction. You know, potentially the dispute could have ended up at the ICJ, arbitration via UNCLOS, other kind of arbitration. I mean, mediation, negotiation, you name it, right? Why arbitration? It was all about jurisdiction and the likelihood of winning. So the president of, president of the Philippines at that time hired, well, involved in the case, bunch of people from the government, and they interviewed legal firms. And they say, you know, this is what's going on, obviously, in South China Sea. Can you give us an estimation? Do we have a chance of having any sort of relief? Um, they interviewed several law firms, including um, law firms in the United States, and settled in on lead legal counsel Paul like, Reichler. Um, he was a um, lead counsel for the Philippines. Why? Because Reichler gave the answer that the Philippine uh, government wanted to hear, and we interviewed him. And the questions that he said that, that they were very important, like what is the scope? What is the viability of arbitration? What is the chance that Philippines can get meaningful relief? And arbitration, Annex 7 arbitration was it. Now, you may think people really know about that case, but they don't really know about the details. And I think they're counterintuitive. China placed a reservation on obligatory dispute settlement, saying that any cases dealing with sovereign maritime delimitation, any military activities, and any questions of historic rights were out of the question, excluded. So, Philippine legal team knew they cannot ask to delimit sovereignty, they cannot ask about any delimiting of maritime zones, no historic title, and that's what China is all the time talking about. And no military activities. And some of those incidents um, were of military heritage. So, so what did the Philippines do? Number one, they wanted clarification that China's nine-dash line is not valid. Okay? Now we have ten-dash line. It's got updated. It includes more. <laughs> But it used to be nine dash line. Do you guys know what's nine dash line? So China pretty much, <laughs> it's unclear where this comes from. It's literally the policymakers, Chinese policymakers, um, took a pen and drew, like, imagine this red except in dashes, somewhat, okay? It's called Nine Dash Line. There, there, there's a huge claim that China is um, putting forth, pretty much including the entire South China Sea. We call it Nine Dash Line now. It's Ten Dash Line, but back then it was Nine. So Philippines was like, okay, why don't we ask the tribunal to say it's invalid? That's it. Don't tell me who's a spreadly islands. Um, don't tell me who's are some some other islands. But what, I, what the Philippines did want to know is determination of the status of the maritime features. Do you know what that means? It's for the arbitral tribunal to say, is this an island or is this a rock? No, not whose is it? Because remember, they couldn't ask that, right? Isn't that strategic? Now, why would Philippines want to know if something is a rock, an island, or a low tide elevation? because those different features generate different maritime entitlements. If you have an island, 
you are entitled to 200 nautical miles of exclusive economic zone, yes? If you have a rock, you stuck with 12 nautical miles, that's it. If you have a low time elevation, you get zero. So Philippines knew if those maritime features, spratly islands, if they're gonna be considered non-islands, like rocks or submerged features, Philippines cannot claim the exclusive economic zone, but China can't either. Do you see here? Very strategic, very clear. And Philippines also made sure in the statement of claims by saying, we do not seek maritime delimitation. We do not want to deal with historic titles. None of those. Super strategic. They selected actors. So people involved in the case. What do I mean by this? Well, like I said, they interviewed multiple firms. They settled on Paul Reichler from Foley Hoag because, you know, the firm said, legal firm is going to give you a range of outcomes and say, you know, here is impo improbable, here is improbable. I'm kind of can't guarantee you outcome somewhere in the middle. And this is what the Philippine wanted to hear. Um, they really pressed for selection of certain arbiters. They <coughs> analyzed the rulings um, in order to ensure that a specific outcome was going to take place. And they did. I mean, really, I would say that, <coughs> well, Philippine emerged as a clear winner. But what people, most of the people don't realize that it was not about sovereignty. Who is what? It was, whoa, what are we talking about? Super strategy. All right, so that's it. So conclusions. You know, I think that the book, well, number one, was super fun to write because I got to speak with people, all kinds of people, um, lawyers, policymakers, legal counsel, uh, generals, uh, <clears throat> maritime admirals, people that are actually in those, involved in those disputes. And I think what emerged to us from the, from the research is that there's so much human element in international relations and international law, in how those disputes are settled. It matters who knows whom. What is your jurisprudence? What is your experience? Have you won? Have you lost? So, to some extent, those disputes are idiosyncratic. <clears throat> we have patterns, and you know, there's so much in the book. I just picked, I think, the most kind of cool stuff. Um, different regions have different preferences for different methods. Um, and it's very true that regional kind of custom influence how we view dispute resolution. And you know, the unfortunate thing is that those disputes will continue because we can just look around the world nowadays. And majority of ongoing wars and lower level militarized disputes are over territory or maritime zones. And people are dying, you know, so, so it's very sad. At least, um, hopefully, the book will show that there are some strategies to settle these. So I'm looking forward to your questions, and thank you for listening. So Amelia will just open up the floor, yeah. to, and you can pick on whoever you like. Sure. Very, very interesting. I'm wondering about um, a couple of related aspects that you, you didn't touch on explicitly. So the, the first is, um, is there a sort of a, both a difference across these resolution mechanisms in, in access and whether or not the other side has to agree um, to, to the resolution, right? Because then the strategic calculation doesn't just become which venue favors me, but also which venue would the other person, or the other, the other state um, agree to. Um, and, and related to that, the question of enforceability after the fact, right? So in, if, you, if you think about the, the dispute you just talked about, if China chooses not even to show up um, to, uh, to the arbitration, what are the chances that it's actually going to comply with whatever the, the outcome or the ruling is, right? And so I, I wonder to what extent that also plays a role, right? I, I, sure, I want a venue that's favorable to me, 
but I may also need to get the other side to agree to that venue, and I also want a venue that my, whose judgment ultimately is going to be implemented, and those may, may pull in opposite directions, right? Yes, so I'm gonna give a very quantitative answer. During that time, a little over 120 disputes, territorial, were resolved peacefully, and we captured all of those. But our data set has about 3,000 observations because we code proposals. So let's say I have a dispute with you. And I'm saying, would you like to mediate? Like, you say no, but would you like to negotiate about it? I said no. And then I said, how about adjudicate? You say yes, and we go. Okay? Number one principle in those disputes, any dispute in international law, is state consent. It's just not happening unless they're consenting. There are some exceptions when the Security Council get involved, and, and then they have to settle it, but otherwise, it's states' consent. And the UN Charter gives states really unprecedented choice of venue. You can do this, 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 comma, and a method of your choice. But now I'm coding proposals over time. So I'm kind of trying to capture my true preference. So continuation of the dispute is just more expensive than settling and potentially losing. And states just comply most of the time. Not always, but most of the time they, they, they really do. Even if they're super annoyed about it. They will say it's illegitimate. Um, <laughs> um, they disagree, but eventually they comply with serious, serious judgments that take away sea access, for instance, you know, distribute sovereignty, reconfigure temples here and there, they comply. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, I apologize beforehand for being very cynical. Um, okay. And, and, and I think that you'll understand that's where the cynical is from because I'm from Taiwan. Sure. Um, I think when you're mentioning about the compliance <coughs> of territorial disputes, and we're talking about um, like China in the arbitration being an outlier. Is there a presumption in the book that these compliance, say you say 88% um, are being complied, are because of these countries being at least on similarly or somewhat equal footing? Because as we can see from the Nicaragua case, as we can see from the South China arbitration, we can see, you know, maybe it's still pending in the ICJ where um, the Ukraine, the Ukrainian government is suing the Russian government. That I think, like, the expectation is the Ukrainians might win, but then, like, whether the Russians are going to comply or not is a different question, right? Mm -hmm. So, is there a calculation for at least for the permanent members of the Security Council where, like, they're just not going to do these things because? Like, 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 realistically, there's no way for if we want to find them, right? And then when, when you're talking about Bahrain, um, sorry, I can't remember, I, I think it was Qatar, right? Like, these are countries at similar footings, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's more incentive for them to come close to each other and then resolve their disputes peacefully. So I'm also wondering if there's a presumption in this study where, at least when we're talking about dispute settlements, the parties are in somewhat equal footing. I think that's a great comment. I'm really grateful for it. I think the book, we do not measure compliance in this book. I just responded to a question about compliance. This deals with choices. However, we do account for states' power. And we do see that the more powerful a country is, the less likely it is to resolve to binding methods a very strong statistical result, I would say, throughout my entire academic career. Right. Always statistically significant. They're going to try to negotiate. They're going to try to propose negotiations. Maybe mediation with somebody somewhat biased, yes? But not adjudication, not arbitration. Super strong. They're just not even going to try. And does that mean that international law is a, a, like a legitimate, perfect legal system? No. Think about the rule. Uh, we have this unspoken norm, I would say, with regard to selecting judges for the International Court of Justice. Permanent members of the Security Council get a seat, even though they don't recognize the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. 
So right now, the president of the court is a U.S. judge, U.S. does not recognize, and the vice president is a Russian judge. So I think what I'm trying to say that the reality of the world is the balance between the two. And law is always going to be coming against those, those power, strategic consideration that you will have China, that is just like going to have an empty, right, the bottle, yes? But imagine the world without it, I guess I would say. Yeah. So, Amelia, I mean, I think I want to build on Professor Vandenberg's comment on the last one, because I, you say you, the book doesn't, you were open about it, doesn't uh, look at the rate of compliance, although you have a generally a very high compliance rate for those mm -hmm. kind of things that do go to arbitration or adjudication. Um, so, but I wonder if you think about the strategy that states are going for. So they want to win, but they also want not just to win the judgment, they want the island back. They want the, um, whatever, the, the EEZ, exclusive economic zone, to be broader than you know they have it at present. And so, if you win a judgment, but you know the chances of compliance are very low, which surely was true with the Philippines in the South yeah. China Sea dispute. And going to Professor Weber's question, China couldn't avoid jurisdiction because there is always one mandatory basis of jurisdiction in the Convention on the Law of the Sea. So they, they had all the exceptions they could. And yes, I think it's very strategic the way they crafted their claim to stay within jurisdiction. But there's another set of literature out there that says this was a terrible mistake for the Philippines mm -hmm. because they, in some ways, um, angered China even more. And actually what we're seeing is China taking over more and more of these islands where there are, um, that it's now become the use of force, which it might not have before. So I just wonder what's your response to that? I mean, can you have a situation, maybe I'll put it differently, where from the perspective of the outcome of the tribunal, it's a win, but in terms of what you want in the real world, it's a loss. Mm -hmm. I think a very important thing to realize that winning, perception of winning, is very personalistic subjective. Um, very often both states, and it's clear that one have lost, they both say that they're won. Um, I think very, I mean, when you have neighboring states that are in friendly relations with each other, we see very often s such states resorting to adjudication arbitration and accepting suboptimal outcomes um, for both of them in order to kind of keep the overall relationship positive. But I don't know if that answers your question. Sometimes objectively, the repercussion of an outcome, even if it's a victory, are detrimental for the state, like we see arguably in the context of the Philippines, arguably. No, there's still rhetoric in the Philippines that they have emerged as this, as this rule of law supporter, all kinds of things, that they um, increase their legitimacy as a supporter for international law. But do we see militarization of South China Sea? Yes. Um, did it change China behavior? I would say no. But did we have some victories in international law? Yes. We have clarification of facts. Um, I would say moving away from the parties, this is the first judgment that defined what's an island, for instance, like the huge contribution. I would say it is what it is, Larry. Professor Hell. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in disputes where states have mutually agreed to a mode of resolution with the strategic anticipation of the mode being favorable or the specific forum being favorable to them, what has caused in the past miscalculations about that perceived chance of victory? 
What is what? Cause those miscalculations. Ah, the because they yes. lost. Right. Okay, so I will give you an example because I love to give a real world example. Okay. Um, it's Bolivia and Chile dispute. In 2018, decision issued, um, went to the International Court of Justice, and Bolivia, which is a long landlocked country, wanted sovereign access to the sea via territory that used to be Bolivian, they used to be a coastal state, but then they attacked Chile and Chile got angry at the territory Bolivia is landlocked. So Bolivia is suing Chile saying, hi, I want the sovereign access to the sea, I want to be coastal, yes? They pay million, millions of dollars for legal counsel. Chile paid about like $24 million to defend themselves, right? Um, president of Bolivia, Evo Morales, is pretty much running on Bolivia becoming a coastal state. They are celebrating Day of the Sea Day, where they march around with like access to the sea flag. It's comical, really. And then what happens in 2018? Bolivia loses. You know, no more maritime, no more coastal state. Chile is excited, the money they paid to the lawyers paid off. But, but why did Bolivia do that? Because they're miscalculated. You know, sometimes states, leaders of states pursue certain things for, I would say, personal gains. This was a very nationalistic move. The whole time Bolivia was engaged in the dispute, um, President Evo Morales personally showed up at the International Court of Justice several times. Like Those things just don't happen. So I think he was building up the momentum um, only to have lost. Um, interestingly, Chile turned around and sued Bolivia about another issues like shortly after because they have won. So I, cases like this are, I wouldn't say miscalculation, <coughs> You know, a legal firm sometimes, and this is what one person told me, you know, we're all drunk on our, on our own wine. So you need a lawyer that's going to tell you a wiggle room. But sometimes there's an outcome that's unpredictable um, that's going to happen also. <laughs> I hope you like the example, because I always imagine the flags and them walking around love the sea day, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can see how it was probably somewhat useful to have the definitions for what was an island and what isn't, for the, the Philippines versus China, it was tribunal. But I feel like the loss of legitimacy for that court now has got to exceed any... Because like, even if now we have some international definition that can be used in these international courts of what's an island and what's not, doesn't the fact that China does not care at all about it and is publicly disrespecting the outcome of, of this tribunal, doesn't that mean that that definition is even less likely to be applied in future cases because people will have less trust that whatever they say even matters? So this was Annex 7 arbitration, permanent court of arbitration. That court was established in 1899. Um, and I would say its use over time has increased tremendously. Um, this arbitration court now hears cases not only between states but also between states and arbitrators. I think that Chinese non-compliance was anticipated by the global audiences and it did not diminish the legitimacy of the court itself. I think it solidified the image of China as unwilling to abide by this version of international law. This would be my sense of um, expectations, that global audiences, when states do not comply, don't turn on the venue, but have, have negative attitude towards the non-compliant states, most of the time. Now, does it send a signal, I mean, international law is disregarded sometimes but by some states. Does it mean that it's illegitimate? <laughs> you know, 
I would say no. It's just the best that we have. Um, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Amelia, you, uh, really interesting. Um, you said that you have some somewhere close to 3,000 observations because there are a lot of proposals, mm -hmm. and yet there's just 120 disputes or something like that, which is a ratio of a little bit under 30 mm -hmm. to each dispute. <clears throat> so... Is there a pattern in the proposals? Is there a gaming? Is can you talk a little bit more about that ratio? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So states most of the time do nothing. So if we were to look, and I think I have actually a slide about this I can show. Um, that the oh there it is. Um, yeah. So all <coughs> territorial dispute by proposal year. If we count only active proposals, most of the time it's negotiations. So 72%. Then non-binding method, and then if states decide to go for big, like binding, they don't really go to arbitration, they go for adjudication. Um, first, as a first proposal, again, states like to negotiate. They try the easy route. And then, you know, non-binding arbitration adjudication. So, and there, there are different patterns, regional patterns. For instance, um, well, Middle East, like I said, and Levant, they love mediation. Africa likes adjudication. Asia, Oceania prefer negotiations. Um, and so does Europe, if I recall correctly. So it's, it's really interesting that the way that it shakes down, I guess, or whatever the saying is. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think it might be a related question since you looked at the data, but I'm curious as to how like the balance or the choices of states have changed as like the global balance of power mm -hmm. has changed in this time period from like bipolarity to mm -hmm. bipolarity, now we're back into like multipolarity. Is that affecting like the decisions of states to use these methods? Yes. The book has a graph over time variance. And I think third party methods over time have become more popular. So states tend to now incorporate more and more third parties to help them resolve. Um, and of course, we can kind of think about it. Um, during Cold War, ICJ was, was really not used much because states didn't, for, from one side or another, didn't trust it really. Um, but over time, we see a change here. And I, I also see a growth in arbitration. It used to be when states had a dispute and they wanted something binding, they just go to ICJ. But now with permanent court of arbitration and arbitration being offered via UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, we see growth. Negotiations are always the most frequent, always. <coughs> um, states just want to talk, thing, talk things through. Thank you for that. Why the maybe that that, the, that that graphic kind of um, maybe why do you have explored the different regions attitude towards the adjudication of international by international tribunals? For example, my point is the European maybe they greatly okay our we we are willing to enter into adjudication and maybe just the say the. Asian states or other states, they are trying, they maybe doesn't affect by the national law, so they are willing to negotiate maybe at the first. Even in the later, they maybe don't agree to enter into adjudication. So you're asking me why are there regional patterns? Uh, my point is why is the <coughs> attitude? Or why? Why the different attitude? That, yeah, so why does the different attitude towards the international law adjudication affect their choice? Oh, yes, yes, okay. So, you know, there, there are some, I believe, deeply embedded preferences for certain methods in different cultures. We know, for instance, that in Islam, Islamic law, mediation, conciliation always takes precedence. It's this kind of approach to brotherly solution. Um, and this holds um, for the region. In Asia, we see a different approach in trying to avoid so-called westernized courts. 
and trying to go via the route of negotiations and maybe regional organizations also. I strongly believe in, in the fact that different cultures simply put have different preferences toward dispute resolution because they conceptualize dispute resolution differently. What seems fine to me may not seem fine to somebody else. And those patterns translate to those preferences. You know, sometimes states that dislike the courts are pushed to use them because their preferred method doesn't work. This is what we saw in Bahrain Qatar dispute. They tried to mediate for years. Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, like Arab League, everybody tried and tried and tried. Nothing. Finally, there was a lot of gas. It had to be drilled. The dispute had to be settled. The only option was the ICJ. And that's what they did. But first they tried, like, multiplicity of venues. Thank you. And have you seen in the strategy of countries to uh, choose a venue um, also have the strategy to use first negotiation in order to gather maybe more information to go then for the arbitration or education or like yes. multiple? Yes, states are very strategic to get information, um, to delay things. They will pretend they're negotiating in good faith. They pretend they're looking for a mediator, and then they know it's going to fail. Yeah, it's all about time. Absolutely. Yeah, so I have a question. With the maritime disputes, given UNCLOS's possibility generally of kind of forcing an arbitration, it's kind of interesting that you don't see more arbitration, you know, kind of given that a you, someone can act unilaterally. I mean, it's interesting here that in the when you pick, put up the, the map of the nine dashes, there were so many Chinese neighbors, any of whom could have done that. And you imagine that all of them are also getting dragged along by Philippines' decision and might be not delighted with Philippines' decision. Mm -hmm. um, but that kind of, you know, it seems like with most territorial disputes, there isn't kind of a background treaty regime mm -hmm. that can then kind of force you into one of these options. But UNCLA seems to be the exception. So you see this major difference between maritime and territorial disputes. And then secondly, I'm just curious how many maritime arbitrations we're seeing out of UNCLOS because given kind of the ability for one state to pull the trigger, you know, kind of are we, is the lack of a lot of UNCLOS arbitrations kind of mm -hmm. itself interesting? This is really great because, yes, UNCLOS has this framework that if one party doesn't show up, doesn't agree, Annex 7 arbitration, so it's kind of like this default going on. Um, I think that really it, uh, the framework of UNCLOS, it's still gaining legitimacy over time. We actually see quite a bit arbitration there. It's just that states don't really seek actively resolutions that often. And if they do go to arbitration, it's, it's really magnificent, and those cases take a long time. So I think 10, 20 years from now, we'll see more, even, in my opinion. Um, so that's the arbitration. And the other one, Rachel? No, it's just whether or not that really kind of, whether maritime disputes are fundamentally different. Oh, from yes, yes, yes. disputes because of that. And, and how many arbitrations have there been under the clause? I actually am not even sure. Yeah, I don't know by, by today, because the book ends, I think, 2015, the data now. So I have to look at, but that's, I think it's increasing. We see more and more. I mean, Mauritius Maldives just settled a major maritime dispute in 2022. Um, there, there's a variety of ongoing maritime disputes. Um, but here is interesting. States may not, not always want to use the UNCLOS framework. They may want to do something else, like conciliation, mediation, to kind of avoid that. And that's also a strategy in my opinion. Now, are those two kinds of disputes different? Yes, they are, because to me, law of the sea is a derivative of law of territory. I mean, you don't, you don't have a conflict over maritime zones if, if you're not like territorially um, somehow uh, related to, to each other. So they have different patterns. Does UNCLOS arbitration require conciliation or mediation before you use it? 
I think that UNCLOS sets up conciliation kind of as a prime to go to method. Um, and states can place, can choose up front what they want to do. So UNCLOS actually lets states have those declaration in which they say, in case I have a dispute, I will go to ICJ. I will go to UNCLOS. I will go to arbitration. Um, and then if, let's say, two states have different a priori preferences, they also go to arbitration. So you can, you can say what you want to say, like go where you want to go if the other party agrees. So. Right. Well, we've just about exhausted the time. Uh, and you had quite a lot of questions, which shows you how much interest there is in the topic. So. Uh, I think it's, you've given us a lot of food for thought to think about and what to look for in the future, both in terms of questions of compliance and, and strategy at the different levels of strategy and, and how to frame claims, which is for law students obviously critically important. So please join me in thanking Professor Powell.